Ah, uh, yes. Welcome to the program. Jason Butchel is going to join me in a moment to preview the upcoming GOP debate and our pregame power hour. Connor Boyack is here to talk about the mediocrity of our education system under Joe Biden. But we start by doing Mother Nature. Yes, Mother Nature. Mother Nature, not a real thing. It's a very little known fact these days. It seems uh, it's not someone we should actually care about because they're not actually a thing. Uh, but still, Apple wanted you to care. Apple mocked for a cringy sketch with actress as Mother Nature touting company's climate change efforts. And this is, I mean, cringy is a good word for it, but it does not describe how awful this actually is. Um, let's watch a little bit of this and give you a sense as to how incredibly stupid Apple is in their efforts to try to make you uh, believe they are uh, climate neutral or whatever their claim is. Uh-oh. There's an Apple board meeting and there's sound. Something's coming. Who could it possibly be? Yes, it's an actress you kind of know from something, but also Mother Nature. I hope we didn't keep you waiting. Mother Nature, welcome to Apple. Tim how how is the weather out. getting in? Well, how is the weather? And then the weather changes, see? see? The weather was however I wanted it to be. Ah. ah, see, she can change the weather whenever she wants. And here's the thing, um, then just change it so global warming's not happening, right? Couldn't you just stop all the catastrophes? Really, it's however you wanted it to be. Well, then why are we dealing with all these terrible uh, natural disasters every year for the past thousand years? Why, why not just stop those? Well, I guess that's not going to be answered by the stupid uh, uh, Apple ad. Um, but what's interesting about this is it's really just a piece of corporate propaganda to try to make you believe that they are the greenest, most nice company in the entire universe. Um, here is the setup to Mother Nature's Apple campaign. In 2020, you promised to bring Apple's entire carbon footprint to zero by 2030. Henry David Thoreau over here said we have a profound opportunity to build a more sustainable future for the planet we share. I think our 10 o'clock said the same thing. They all do. All right. This is my third corporate responsibility gig today, so who wants to disappoint me first? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, other companies aren't doing as well as Apple is. But the, the, the general concept is kind of true here. Instead of Mother Nature coming into these corporate boards and demanding uh, they change the way they make their products and judging them like Mother Nature is judging Apple, there's just some paid activist who comes in and has some, you know, corporate initiative to uh, spread to stockholders and ESG people and, and try to make it look like they actually care about the environment. Now, do they? I don't know. Maybe Tim Cook does care. I mean, my guess is he's not living the perfect carbon neutral personal life. And honestly, like, you, do, you, do you think they really care about this stuff? I don't know. Maybe they do. I wouldn't doubt it, I suppose. Maybe they actually buy this stuff. But they want you to believe they're buying it, that's for sure. And they wanted to talk about how awesome they are with their materials. This is, again, they're trying to claim they're a wonderful company doing everything to please Mother Nature. Watch. Materials status. Is there a materials person here? Yes. We are in the process of eliminating all plastic from our packaging by the end. Let me guess. 50 years from now when someone else is left holding the bag. By the end of next year, actually. When we're also currently using 100% recycled aluminum in the enclosures of all our MacBooks, Apple TVs, Apple Watch. What about iPod Shuffle? Uh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't do it's a joke. Don't you people make Ted Lasso? Oh, that's a different group. Um, we're also phasing out leather in our iPhone cases. What about Brando over there? They phasing you out too? Oh. Yeah, because he's wearing a leather jacket and, and they're going to get rid of... Uh, I mean, look, this is obviously terrible uh, in every single way and makes you want to cringe into a, until you physically turn inside out and your body gives up trying to operate because it's so cringeworthy. Um, but you see the point here, of course, you know, they're they're doing everything to make your life better by cutting out plastics in their packaging and recycling the aluminum for their products. None of this, of course, is going to make any difference whatsoever when it comes to the climate. Um, but that isn't really the point here. The point is to make you feel good about them, as they did with their electricity pitch as well. 
Electricity, status. Uh, uh, we're operating on 100% clean electricity. What runs on 100% clean electricity? Every Apple office, store, and data center runs on clean electricity, thanks to you and your powerful wind and, and sun. Mm. And Apple offices are already carbon neutral. Yeah. This building is carbon neutral? Oh yeah, we, we do it with a mix of clean energy and eliminating greenhouse emissions. It's kind of like if you were to... You're uh, seriously explaining carbon neutrality to Mother Nature? Right, no, I'm sorry. You want to tell me how photosynthesis works too? Don't. Now, you know, I've always wondered why I like to burn styrofoam in my free time, and the answer is I don't like Mother Nature at all. She seems awful. Uh, I don't like her at all. She seems terrible. Um, so it's not, but they're carbon neutral. Now, do you actually believe that? Now, there's some justification they'll be able to trot out to tell you this, but of course, like, I, you know, we have a, there's an Apple store in, you know, one of our, a couple of our local communities here in Texas. I mean, they're all just in malls. I don't know. They, I don't, I haven't seen giant solar panels on their roof. Are they buying solar power from somewhere? Are they sp spending up with some sort of green credit system so they can justify their zero emissions? Probably. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would be surprised if they were completely faking it, uh, but of course, God only knows what's happening in their factories in China and all of the other places where they're, in, you know, using slaves to buy, to make the iPhones and, and, and everything else that they're talking about here. Like, is that better? Is that be like, yeah, well, they're carbon neutral, but we are, you know, basically enslaving groups of people overseas. I guess that's up to you to judge. Here's uh, their, their position. They want you to know about transportation. Transportation. I'm proud to report that we're shipping more products by ocean rather than air, which reduces oh, wow. transportation by emissions by 95%. Wow. 95%? Not too bad. I'm also happy to report that we're investing in projects around the world that protect the Earth's soil, plants, and trees. <laughs> Everyone says they're planting trees. We've planted forests. Oh, hello. Where? Paraguay, Brazil. What, are you trying to save the tropical savanna? Yes. And we've also restored mangroves in Colombia. What else? Grasslands in Kenya. Why? Our aim is to permanently remove carbon from the atmosphere. Oh God, this is just so cringeworthy. By the way, just hey, Mother Nature, get off your ass and do it yourself. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Why do you need Apple to do these things? Why are you so mean to these companies? Just do it if you're Mother Nature. Uh, uh, by the way, all their products are gonna be carbon neutral by like next week or something, watch. <clears throat> As you can see, we've innovated and retooled almost every part of our process to reduce our impact on the planet, but there's still a lot more work to do. And there's something else we wanted to share with you. You're not trying to bribe Mother Nature with Apple swag. It's Apple's very first carbon neutral product. Hmm. I want to see you do more of this. You will. When? Yeah, well. By 2030, so all, all Apple devices else. will have a net have zero net climate zero impact. Climate impact. All, all of them? All of them. All of them. They better. I've, they will. They will. <laughs> I like how she's actually acting here and he's just kind of blankly staring. <laughs> uh. Okay, good. See you next year. <sighs> Don't disappoint your mother. Don't disappoint your mother. Oh gosh, I can't believe that mother. Let me tell you my impressions of this. And I, this is going to be harsh, but I want you to hear it directly from me. Mother nature is a bitch. And I said this this morning before I saw this ad. I didn't know they portrayed her as a bitch, but the truth is Mother Nature is and always has been a bit of a bitch. It's not about the way she acts in this particular Apple propaganda. It's the way she sorts of, she treats human beings when human beings aren't there to push back against her. Because everything you like about the world today has to do with Mother Nature being tamed it's not Mother Nature thriving and doing whatever she wants, which is obviously make the world terrible. Let me show you a chart. Here's the chart. 
It's life expectancy going back to the year 1000. See the left part of the chart where everyone's living till 24 or 23 years old and it flatlines for thousands of years. That flat part over there on the left side of the chart, that's Mother Nature. She sucks. She makes your life a living hell. And then man steps in and says, hey, you know what we should do? Unleash capitalism and see what happens. And then you see the hockey stick part of that chart where life expectancy goes basically straight up from about 1900. Congratulations. When the human experience is utilized to tame Mother Nature, that's when life becomes livable. I'll show it to you in another way. Here's a chart. This is from Alex Epstein's book, which is great, by the way. As you see, atmospheric CO2 does tick up from 1920 to 2020 in that century. What you also see is a drop in climate-related deaths by over, over 98%. If you do it on a per-person, per capita basis, it's over 99%. A 99% drop in climate-related deaths in a century in which every single person of any authority in this country is telling you the climate is out of control. Does this make any sense to anyone? We can all sit here and watch and wonder as Apple doesn't use plastics in their $1,500 products built by slaves in China. Wow, let's all clap for Apple. But the reality of the situation, of course, is we have very little part of the impact of what Mother Nature does. We, of course, are sitting here all using crappy paper straws while Apple takes the plastic out of their products and does nothing to benefit the climate and, of course, change the situation in any meaningful way. Let me show you a clip from Alan Jones. He's an Australian TV host, uh, and he was talking to some climate experts. And I just want you to understand how little of a piece of the puzzle you and I and our decisions to use plastic or paper straws are in the grand scheme of things. Watch. You don't know what percentage of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide, and yet you're prepared to stand the economy on its head to address a problem the detail of which you don't know. So when I then explain that the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, Alice, is how much? Reserve Alice, base. how much of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? To answer Alice? the question, Scott Morrison has said he Al believes in how climate much? change Alice, and that how he much? wants to do something about Alice, it. Alice, how much carbon dioxide is the problem? How much carbon dioxide is there in the atmosphere? I'm not a scientist. I don't oh. know. Oh. I'm a well, hang on. If you're going to argue the case, you ought to know. It's 0.04 of a percent. And of that 0.04 of a percent, human beings around the world create 3%. It's like saying there's a granule of sugar on the Harbour Bridge. Clean the bridge up, it's dirty. Surely if a political party doesn't know the quantum of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, what the hell are we standing the economy on its head for? Hmm. We're standing the economy on its head because climate change is a religion. You know, Mother Nature is used in this ad to replace God, right? God is the one who controls the weather. Well, no, it's going to be Mother Nature. It's going to be some friendly actress acting very mean to everyone and, 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 and uh, trying to spread Apple's propaganda for them. But when you treat climate change as if, a, as if it's a religion, you create a situation in which people will react crazily to please that particular God. Now, the real God, I don't think, is judging uh, our tr plastic choices. Maybe he is. I don't know. Maybe we'll get up there and be like, hey, you know, that whole abortion thing, you wanted to stop. That wasn't a problem at all. What we were really worried about is how much recycled aluminum you were using in your watches. Maybe that's going to be the way this all plays out. I don't think so. I don't think that's the way it works. But if you can get a, a group of people to essentially turn their decision-making process over to Mother Nature. Instead of looking at the, as the, at the Earth as a place for humans to thrive, and instead looking at the Earth as a place for humans to only negatively impact, you create a situation where you can control economies, you can control people's decision-making process, you can control their lives based on this brand new religion you've just created. I, I, I assume it's a really powerful thing in the minds of, of the left and the media. Maybe it gets them to their goals a little bit faster. But the facts do matter here. And the fact that that ad was about the cringiest thing I've ever seen in my entire life, whether you agree with climate change or not, that fact that the ad sucks remains the same.
Uh, do you think your face enjoyed the summer as much as you did? I love being outside. I love being outside in the summer sun, but you know, I think it does damage your face after a while, damages your skin. That's why you need GenuCell. GenuCell is a must have after months of record heat and humidity, especially if you're somewhere down south. Sunspots, brown spots, uh, discoloration, even red inflamed patches, all can disappear in front of your very eyes with GenuCell. And here's the thing, I, I would hear a claim like that and I'd be like, oh, whatever, GenuCell is just saying what they have to say to sell some products. But here's the thing, they guarantee it. So, you know, if you use this and you don't see results day one, you can have your money back. So why take, why not take, uh, take them up on this and, you know, take on a challenge that really has no risk for you? Take advantage of GenuCell's most popular package, which now includes the Dark Spot Corrector, plus classic GenuCell bags and puffiness treatment uh, with immediate effects, all at 70% off. Uh, you can get the best skincare in the world for yourself completely risk-free. It's simple. Go to GenuCell.com slash stew today. Start looking years, even decades younger, starting tomorrow. GenuCell.com slash stew. Say goodbye to the dark and liver spots, bags and puffiness under the eyes, crow's feet and all. Just go to GenuCell.com slash stew right now. It's G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash stew. I'm going to bring in Jason Buttrell. He's the head writer and researcher for Glenn Beck. Uh, Jason, how's it going? Good. Uh, I will say, head writer, researcher, Glenn Beck, blah, blah, blah. Who cares? <laughs> That's something you're never going to put on your resume. We all know that. <laughs> what you would put on your resume, however, is uh, Power Hour. Power uh, yes. Hour player right here, Jason Buttrell, who I believe you claim you're still winning Power Hours. Is that the way this works? Four or five now? Yeah. I've lost count. Yeah, it's, no. like, it's like Cowboys Super Bowl trophies. I've lost count at this point. I know? mean, it has been hard to count them lately. <laughs> I would agree with you on that one. No, it's been very <laughs> difficult. Um, actually, it's funny. On uh, Wednesday, right, it's the debate night coming up next week. Um, we were going to do coverage of this. This show happens to air right before the, the debate's going to start. So we're like, well, we'll do a debate sort of pregame. We were talking about the options, and Jason is actually the one who suggested a pre-debate, pregame power hour, uh, analyzing the debate and doing one shot of beer per minute for an hour. See, th th this is what I do before every debate anyway. Right. Because now I just I can't get through them. Yeah. What do we get from debates now? Do we get anything? I know. You can't do them so you can't watch them sober. Obviously. You can't you can't That's do it. That's crazy. You really can't. And then you know that nothing substantial is gonna be said. Like back in the day, like when you would see like Reagan squaring off or something like that, you like you knew you were in for something. Yeah. Nowadays what? Like I think I think <laughs> It's because, like, journalists, I think they're all, the only thing journalists are doing, and I wish they wouldn't have journalists moderate these things anymore, but the only thing that journalists are doing, because they know the climate, like, they know how these things can be clipped and put straight to Twitter, and they are in real time, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. But they're just looking for that gotcha question so that they are the star, not anything that's coming out of the candidate's mouth. It's so irritating. It is. Um, let me push back a little bit, though, on your depression over debates, because <laughs> I, will, I will admit it's going to be a lot better uh, after our power hour. But, but, like, I thought the last one, there was some good substan substantive uh, debate, conversation, policy-related conversation. It wasn't as um, hype-worthy as something with Donald Trump involved, of course, when he's not there, which he's not in this one as well. It's never going to be as, never as many eyeballs are going to be there. But I will say, like, I thought they actually talked about some issues. Like, you know, the, the Nikki Haley conversation, she seemed to do really well in the polling after this debate. I didn't think she did that well in real time. Um, I thought she'd be dinged for her abortion stance, for instance. Yeah. She actually seemed to do really well uh, coming out of that poll-wise. I do think we learned something. It just... In the grand scheme of things, with Trump up by 30 or 40 points, it's not quite as interesting. Yeah, it kind of seems like everybody up there is just, that. that's not really a debate stage for the next president. It's the debate stage for who can get Tr Donald Trump's attention the most and the rest of them jockeying for a cabinet position. That's mm. what it really feels like. I I'd, love to, I I'd love to ask uh, Ron DeSantis um, how long he will stay in this, in this race. Mm. I, I, I was just looking at the poll numbers, and they're absolutely insane. Um, I, th I, th I think they were good as of, like, Tuesday or something like that, so they're still pretty accurate. But um, Donald Trump's running away with this thing, and it's and the gap is only getting crazier. And I was actually looking at a graph that had uh, Donald Trump and uh, Ron DeSantis, just the two of them, mm -hmm. and um, DeSantis was skyrocketing. I mean, he was still low, like he was still getting beat, but he was, well, I won't say skyrocketing, he was steadily going up. Okay. And um, the the time that, it, st that it, it, it stopped doing so, I think was like around April 2nd or something like that. And that was the exact moment that Alvin Bragg made it official that he was going to 
uh, indict. So everyone gets what they moment. want I, w w with this, which is frustrating. Yes. With the exception of Ron DeSantis, of course. And the, and the, but, but then if it, yeah, New York gets him. it, Alvin Bragg gets what they want, the left gets what they want, the media gets what they want, Trump gets what he wants. He doesn't want an indictment, but he gets a, he's, takes a massive lead. And it has helped him immensely. Every time a new indictment happens, you see another spike. DeSantis mm. is going down, Trump's going up. Now, that, there has been, there's been a large uh, separation for a while. It hasn't necessarily expanded that much, though. It's, it's ticked up a little bit for Trump, to your point, um, a little bit down for DeSantis. Some of that has gone to people like Vivek Ramaswamy and others, that Nikki Haley, who have kind of popped up a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, like, we haven't had any votes yet. There's no real incentive for Ron DeSantis to leave. He's got plenty of money. You know, someone has to be the person who's challenging Trump at the end. And it's possible if all these other people drop out, I mean, Trump is still only around 50 percent. If that comes down to 40, there's a chance that someone could coalesce the rest of the voters and make a run at this. No, not to mention that you have all these indictments. Who knows how that plays out? He may go to prison. That's true. Um, but do you think that would help or hurt him? I think that would actually help him at this probably point. It's such help. a crazy uh, time. It probably would it, help. But it, at the very least, we have to acknowledge it's a bit unpredictable. We've never seen anything like it before. Who knows what could happen in that scenario? So why would you drop out if you're one of these other candidates? Well, you have, it's a very valid point you have. We still have, what, five months till the first actual, yeah, I think it's February. January. Is yeah, it January or February? Yeah, I think, it's, yeah. I think it's late January. So, yeah, there's still a lot of time, you know, for something to happen. Case in point, uh, Donald Trump's uh, interview on MSNBC. Mm. Um, I don't know whether I should say this or not, because it does, it, if you take a stance either way, both sides will just come after you like angry dogs. Yeah, I've, I've learned just not to care. Um, but I'm going to say this because it's an important, important issue. I was 99% to 100%, 99.9999% voting for Donald Trump in the primary. Just based off the fact that I do not like bullies, he's getting bullied. Yep. And I was like, okay, screw this. And plus, you know, you cannot just look at the weaponization of government and say that that's okay, fine, that's okay. I, with the way they're handling Donald Trump and indicting him every other half hour or so, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just voting for Donald Trump. Yeah. I don't believe in everything he says, um, but I was voting for him. Uh, after that interview where, you know, he was saying he was willing to negotiate with the left on abortion, uh, no, I, I'm not willing mm -hmm. to negotiate that. You cannot call a heartbeat bill, a, 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 what do you call it, a terrible, terrible thing? Yeah, very call it terrible. You cannot say that. You, you just cannot say that. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm not voting for him in the primary. I'm not doing it. It's an important issue. If you care about abortion, it's hard to come up with, well, I guess we'll leave 93% of abortions alone. Like, that's yeah. a really tough line to draw. But, I mean, the argument on the other side is, hey, like, you know, abortion's a tough issue for Republicans. Can be difficult. They've lost a bunch of these uh, votes, even in some red states. He's just reading the room, he's reading the polling, and he's going along with it. Isn't that yeah. the smart thing for him to do? Right. Yeah, and, and I've seen this, this has been a back and forth ever, well, forever. But, um, well, no, no, not, not forever. I, guess, I think that's one of the problems. No, no, no. Let me go back again. That has been the debate, <laughs> yeah. going back and forth. People are like, you know, there's this, uh, there's this great line in Sorkin's uh, The American President where, uh, you know, Martin Sheen says, oh, we only fight the fights that we can win. No, we fight the fights that need fighting. Mm. Mm. Exactly. Now Sorkin's a lefty. Wh whatever. He's you know. a great writer, <laughs> but he's a, great, he's writer. a great, writer. great writer, and that is an amazing point. You, what you believe in your heart is a fight that you think should be engaged in. You go a hundred percent. It's either in something you believe in or it's not. For this, yeah. babies are either babies yeah. or they're either human beings or they're not. Yeah. You cannot negotiate that. <laughs> they're alive or they're not. They're not going to suddenly like pop out as not a human being. Like, oh my God, I had no idea that pencil was going to come out instead of a baby. Yeah. No, it's a person. You're preaching to the choir a little bit here. I hope you know that. But I mean, I will say like, uh, and this is one thing that I think that's got to be frustrating people like Ron DeSantis, right? The arguments you make for Trump in this moment are, look, he's running a general election campaign. He thinks he's already won the primary. He's trying to win people over. He's trying to win moderates over. He's got he's to be a little softer on these issues to win the general election. This is the same argument every establishment Republican would make for Mitt Romney as a candidate, yeah. right? And for some reason, Trump, whose main thing, as you just pointed out, is you want to have his back because he's fighting, right? He's getting attacked. He's being attacked all the time and he's fighting. But on this issue, he's not fighting. He's just being like, ah. Eh. You know, what do you guys want? 
uh, it's just the lives of children. What do you guys, you guys come to some number, we'll all be happy. That's not the Donald Trump that people appreciate right, exactly. the, on the right. Yeah, I, I feel like this is more people, his campaign, his advisors saying, we've got this in the bag. But it's, doesn't he deserve some blame for this, though? Um, he, I, because, yeah, we can always blame his advisors, but, like, he's the guy on TV saying this. Oh, you yeah, know, absolutely, 100%. Yeah, yeah. but I... I yeah, I, but I, but he definitely is the guy that's saying this, and and, he, and he's taking the blame, and I think he's going to reap the consequences for it as well. But they think they've got it in the bag, so now yeah. they're focused on the future. They're focused on how do we pull in some of those moderates that we lost in the last election, because that is what's going to hand in the next election. The independents that vastly moved away from him. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so let me let me wrap you here because we've got it. We're short on time, but you're going to be here talking about all this stuff on Wednesday uh, during. Maybe not as eloquently as you have today. Maybe a little bit more <laughs> slurring some of your words on uh, the Power Hour. It's coming up next Wednesday. It's the hour right before the debate. So this is your pregame coverage, and we'll be making idiots of ourselves. Sarah Gonzalez is going to be here. Uh, Dave Landau is going to be here. There's going to be more as well. It's going to be a lot of fun. Sleeves will not be here that night. No. I, I mean, you're going I, tank right now. Oh, no. I, I've covered it up, He's but it's good. not getting covered up okay. next week. Please. Well, you have to join us now. Jason Buttrell, head writer of research for Glenn Beck. Although Glenn might be denying that right at this moment. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the project. Thanks for having If you've never been through buying or selling a home, you know it's a little bit stressful, especially if you don't have people on your side. You want to have people on your side when you have important moments. You want someone who's fighting for you and the things that you care about. And that's realestateagentsitrust.com. The best real estate agent in your area is going to be on your side. I was just talking to somebody recently who went through realestateagentsitrust.com, and they just said they were incredible. Like They were like my best friend while we were going through this transaction, and they got the job done as well. They were someone that we could actually trust. And when you talk to uh, people, they have a lot of bad experiences with real estate agents. That's not the case with realestateagentsitrust.com. They're going to make sure this transaction goes really well for you on buying on the side of buying and the side of selling. The best price on both sides and the best price for you is that realestateagentsitrust.com is free for you. So you don't have to worry about that at all. realestateagentsitrust.com is the place to go. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, it's time for a truly inspirational tale. Yes, a TikTok post by a woman named Liz. She made her first TikTok po- uh, post in a powerful way, sharing her identity and story, highlighting that there's no wrong time to show up in the world as yourself, as your most fullest, fullest, most auth- authentic self. And the way she expressed that, of course, was to say that, well, she had to have the talk uh, with her mom back when she was 11 years old. And she was so curious and she wanted to ask her mom how, you know, what time was she going to get her period? When was she going to get her boobs? When is she going to use tampons? Uh, The normal questions of a young girl, I suppose. However, this one went a little weird because she sat down and said, hey, uh, actually, you're not going to get any of that crap happening to you. Why? You're biologically male. Um, Now, this woman wants us to believe that she, did. I guess, didn't know she was biologically male. Um, It's a little, I will say, reading news today is almost impossible because I don't know if she was actually just a boy and believed she was a girl and her mom was like, hey, I I love you, kid, but, like, you're a boy and you're not going to get any periods. Or it says here she's intersex, which technically could mean, like, the old school hermaphrodite sort of uh, definition. We maybe got a couple of things going on there. I don't know. I honestly tried to understand the story and I couldn't. It's because they won't, they can't say, they can't admit what it is. They can't just say, well, it's a boy and actually she thought she was a girl. They have to say she was a girl. So I can't really tell uh, which way she went or what was going on. And nor do I want to think about it even uh, any longer. Another thing I don't want to think about anymore is Sam Brinton. Do you remember Sam Brinton? He was the Obama nuclear official (laughs) who uh, got caught stealing luggage and a bunch of women's clothes. Well, after they caught him multiple times, they decided to raid his home, and guess what they found? They found female designers' stolen clothes. They eventually did uh, return the victim's property, and now everything's going to be fine. Um, I assume he'll be completely... I probably won't have to deal with much of anything other than a slap on the wrist... Um, I will say, however, prison jumpers, not nearly as nice as the stuff you find in airport luggage. (music) 
So what would it be like if all of a sudden the global medication supply chain of antibiotics just disappeared overnight? Uh oh. <laughs> but that's what I would do. Uh oh. Well, now I have the Jace case. So I have a little bit more uh, to say than just uh oh, because I can tell you about, yeah, I think, and I don't even know if I have to convince people of this anymore. We've seen the past few years. We saw the COVID era and the ramifications of what happened after, the uh, inflation that happened after that. You can't depend on your medication just being right around the corner anytime you need it. That's why the Jace case exists. It can prepare you with a pack of five courses of antibiotics that can cure things like respiratory infections and sinusitis and skin infections and a whole lot more. It's a great way to be ready for shortages. It's also perfect for traveling. So don't get caught unprepared. Prepare yourself at jacemedical.com. Use the code STU at checkout. You'll get a discount there. The promo code is STU at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. In 1983, the National Commission on Excellence in Education warned, the educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and as a people. Forty years later, are things better or worse? What do you guys think? I've got an opinion on that. I think Connor Boyack does as well. He's the president of the Libertas Institute, author of the Tuttle Twin series, and of course, co-author of the new book, Mediocrity, 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. It's available now wherever books are sold. I don't know, Connor. I, I don't think things have really improved over the past 40 years. It's a question that sadly almost answers itself these days, especially when we see a lot of the test scores coming out. Just a couple of weeks ago, the nation's report card found that only 13% of eighth graders are proficient in American history, which is just appalling. It's worse than failing. I don't know what you call it when it's worse than failing. What's interesting about the quote that you shared from the National Commission on Excellence in Education is that in another part of their report, they said, if a foreign government had attempted to impose upon America the very mediocre education we now have today, we might have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we've allowed this to happen to ourselves. And so if that was the case four decades ago, what's going on today and what does that mean four decades from now for the future of our country? Mm. Uh, so this didn't come from a foreign government. It seem, seems to have come from our own. I mean, you know, you go back in, in the book, you, you talk about the history of, uh, you know, uh, in the Carter administration as we sort of elevated this to a cabinet position. And of course, that's what all good liberals do when they have a problem. They go to the government and they say, hey, if we make a big uh, cabinet uh, position or don't throw a bunch of money at this, we'll fix it. Government is there to be the solution. But that is not how this has played out. It, it, that's true. Uh, we need to also assign fault to all the Republican administrations that have uh, certainly not repealed uh, the U.S. Department of Education, but they've doubled down with things like No Child Left Behind and supported Common Core and all these centrally planned efforts to try and hack at the margins. Uh, there's the great quote from Henry David Thoreau, I think, where he says that for every thousand hacking at the branches of evil, there's only one striking at the root. And so for me, a lot of this is all these programs, all these reforms, all these things that we hear about about. They're all marginal. I mean, they're important. We should talk about them, but they're not really going to reform the core problem that we're seeing in the government schools. I think that core problem is that they're not facing substantial competition. And so costs go up, quality goes down. They have no incentive to really substantially improve, which is why I'm such a big proponent of what are called education savings accounts, where states can unlock those, those education dollars and allow them to follow the child to a private school, a micro school, a home school, something else, so that the the government schools feel a little bit of heat and suddenly now have an incentive to improve to try and earn the customers that they want to keep rather than just assuming that they get to keep them all. Yeah, I really want to get into uh, how we solve this uh, here in a second, but let's go through a couple of the problems because you really are outlining a lot of the real problems with our education system. And one of the things that the left says, the media says all the time, is that the problem is these are underfunded schools. There's not enough money going to these schools. If they had the money that they needed, we'd have much better performance. Uh, but, of course, what do, you, what do you libertarians and conservatives want to do? You want to cut these budgets. Do these schools have enough money? 
Well, if you look at the school districts that spend the most per student per year, it's, you know, liberal bastions like New York and New Jersey and D.C. and some of these places where they're spending about three times more than the national average uh, that everyone else is. And yet they're at the bottom of education proficiency. They're doing the worst. Uh, their Cato Institute and others over the years have clearly uh, done the research on the data showing that over the years as spending has gone up, educational attainment has been flat or is declining. So it's it's clearly the case that more money does not equal improved outcomes. I mean, talk to the average homeschooling family or you know folks at a micro school family. You can educate a child pretty affordably if you're doing it right, if you're incentivized to actually focus on the individuality of that child and build a curriculum that best supports them rather than throwing them all in this one size fits all system where over the years, all, where, I mean, all, where's all the funding going? That's what the you know people are always asking because teachers aren't being paid that much catching up with inflation. What we're seeing across the board is massive administrative bloat in the government schools where they're hiring all of these uh, non-teaching administrators, and that has significantly ballooned in the past few decades relative to student and teacher growth. So that's where we see a lot of the inefficiencies going, which means that this program, these schools have really turned into a jobs program for adults. It's why the teachers unions you know, protect them so fiercely. It's not really about the kids. If it was, we'd get rid of a lot of the bloat and we'd focus on more efficient but so often we have these incumbents who want to now protect their turf, and that's what it's boiled down to. Mm, that's a huge, huge problem. Another thing the left uh, are constantly argues is that, you know, this idea that basically it takes a village, right? Like, the, you don't really have kids yourself. No one has kids yourself. You shouldn't be making those decisions. You need experts. You need uh, government officials to come in here and kind of guide you through this process. They're the experts, after all, Connor. Uh, what, do you, what do you think of that argument? Is there anything there? Oh, boils my blood. Just the other day, the Biden Secretary of Education just came out and was saying, oh, for teachers, they know their kids better than anybody else. Uh, and his was a plea for, you know, teacher autonomy and, and not having legislatures dictate what teachers can do. But the mere fact that he calls them their kids, Biden has said this several times. He When he talks to teacher groups, he says, they're your kids, they're your kids. They're not their kids. At best, these teachers are stewards of those children for a very limited period of time, but they're not their kids. And so often the left forgets that, uh, you know, the village is subservient to the family, not the family to the village. Yes, it does take a village. We're all in this together. We all need one another's help. Community institutions play a powerful role in the development of the child. But all of those things are supporting mechanisms to the core family. And it seems like the left and, and many beyond the left want to upend that societal model and place the state at the forefront and that the family should be subservient to the state. I think that's a horrible model. I think that's uh, that is the path to tyranny, and sadly, that's the path that our public schools are structured to take us down towards. No, it really is amazing. Um, I want to give, play you this clip uh, from uh, from the governor of uh, of North Carolina, Roy Cooper. Uh, he is. I mean, look, I think one of the big solutions here is school choice. I think it's really, really important. It's one of the most important things that's happening right now in the country. Uh, a real movement is happening. And honestly, we've been talking about this issue for so long, it never seemed like we had to get anywhere on it. All of a sudden, since COVID, we've really made real progress here. It's, in, it's been incredible. And of course, this is really threatening the teachers unions. It's really threatening the politicians they've propped up over the years. To the point now where the governor of North Carolina is calling school choice a state emergency. This is incredible. Watch this. I'm declaring this state of emergency because you need to know what's happening. If you care about public schools in North Carolina, it's time to take immediate action and tell them to stop the damage that will set back our schools for a generation. Here's what's happening in the next few weeks. Their private school voucher scheme will pour your tax money into private schools that are unaccountable to the public and can decide which students they want to keep out. Oh, please. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this segment. I, as someone who pays for private school, the fact that they're calling uh, my tax, oh, I, I can't even get into it. I'm going to go crazy and we're not going to have enough time. Connor, please insert some sanity into this moment. 
Well, I, uh, I've i homeschooled my kids for a decade. Just this year, we also put them in a little private micro school. And it's it's appalling to have to first pay taxes for everyone else's kids to a highly inefficient system. And then if I have money left over, I have the good fortune of being able to decide if I want to enroll my you know children in a school or if I want to homeschool them. I think the governor is right. I think this is an emergency for their state. It's been an emergency for 40 years since we were warned in 1983 that it was a rising tide of mediocrity. Now, he's looking at it from the perspective that this is an emergency for the teachers unions and the folks who are very protective of the inefficient status quo and have made a good living off of mediocre performance. Every monopolist hates competition. And so when you create a competitive environment where you're unlocking these education dollars and now they're flowing to other places, of course the monopolists consider that a crisis because for decades they have not had to earn their customers. They have had to really work hard. They haven't had incentives and now they're feeling the heat. So I think he's right to see that it's a crisis. It's just sad that he hasn't considered the past several decades the true crisis for how much our education system has been declining. And I think a bit of healthy competition is needed because again, if this is about the kids, if this is ultimately about helping educate children, we got to do better and nothing we've been doing has worked. It's amazing. I mean, he said he's acting like parents being able to choose where to educate their kids is like a hurricane. It's, it's a state of emergency. Right? It's like, <laughs> how is this possible. Uh, Connor, before you go, what, what's the, give me a minute on like what the state of this movement is. I mean, we really have seen movement here. I, I was hoping we'd get this done in Texas. It doesn't look like it's going to happen just yet. What's the state of the school choice movement right now? Well, as you pointed out a moment ago, Stu, it's exploded post-COVID. Polling on this issue across the country has grown by 10% plus across every demographic. So many people saw during Zoom, all the Zoom schools and all the problems uh, that was happening during the pandemic, excuse me. And and so polling has greatly increased. This has really turned into nationally a Republican-led effort, as is the case in North Carolina, where, as I understand it, the governor is going to get overridden in his veto because the Republicans are in control. So Republican legislation legislators are seeing this rightly as a winning issue as it comes to elections and campaigns. They're seeing that parents are demanding this. My own state in Utah, where I'm based out of, I run a think tank here, Libertas Institute. We got Utah to be the fourth state to have this program. A few others have followed. So I think this is the future. It is the future. I know the teachers unions are going to just be kicking and screaming all the way. They were in Utah. They did in every other state that have tried to pass these. But I'll give you this little, little vignette. When the teachers union in our state protested our bill that was creating one of these laws, these programs, there were about 200 people that showed up with all their posters and, you know, uh, shouting at the politicians and so forth. When we did a rally for parents and students and teachers to come out, we had 10 times the number. We filled the Capitol with over 2,000 people who showed up demanding this. So the parents are mobilized. They're angry. They're fed up with the mediocrity that we've had for decades. They're seeing that this is a winning message, a successful program. So I'm very optimistic that we're going to see these education spending account laws uh, proliferate across the, the country in the years to come. Mm, thank God for that. Connor Boyack, president of the Libertas Institute and co-author of the brand new book, Mediocrity, 40 Ways Government Schools Are Failing Today's Students. You can pick it up wherever you get your books. Connor, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thanks, Stu. We are less than one week away from the next GOP presidential debate. Now, again, Donald Trump's not going to be showing up. He's got some other event. He's going to be doing sort of counter-programming it. Um, but we will have, I think, six people at least have qualified for this particular debate. It's going to be, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I have to say, I don't think Doug Bergamentum is going to be there for this one. Uh, Asa Hutchinson, eh, maybe not so much. Um, but we're going to be doing something that's going to make you forget those terrible things. We're going to be drinking. Yes, the GOP debate pregame power hour. It airs at 8 p.m. Eastern. It will lead you right up for the, uh, to the start of the debate. You'll be nice and buzzed to watch it. And then look at this nice graphic they made with all the six cans and the faces of the candidates that have qualified so far. Chris Christie, Tim Scott, Mike Pence, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy, and Ron DeSantis. That's a good group, actually. Like, I, I got to say, like, if you're going to think of anyone other than Trump, these are probably your six biggest competitors, and it'll be interesting to see them hash this out, especially if you're buzzed. So make sure to join us, blazetv.com slash stew. The promo code is stew, or on our YouTube channel. We'll also have post-game coverage on our YouTube channel as well.